Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it was an even tie on what people wanted to watch, and uh, somebody suggested that um, somebody suggested that uh, I do show axing the spoon blank and then go carve it as a nice compromise. So got this nice piece of cherry, got a few little knots in it, but not too crazy. First whack with this new club that Brian sent me. Nice. Okay. So to reiterate, hmm, ripple here. Uh, I'm going to axe out one spoon blank and then go inside and carve it. If anyone has any questions, feel free to shout out. Uh, Neil, this is your spoon that I'm making right now. Deciding how to orient it. Now, <clears throat> if I have a choice, I like to uh, put the spoon on the parts with the wiggly grain and retain the nice clear straight grain for the handle. Just makes things a lot easier. It's easier to deal with wiggly grain in the bowl because you're already carving around. <clears throat> So you'll notice how I'm not starting right up close to my fingers. My hands are back here. I'm pressing down with the palm of my hand. And this bottom of the blank is going into a hollow in the stump. And uh, that keeps the whole thing from moving. And I can have the blank, excuse me, be angled to the side. And that allows my axe to be basically straight up and down and it'll bite every single time. So if you aren't comfortable, totally comfortable with your tool, start low and walk your way up to the cut you want to make. It's just getting the range of, of your tool and understanding what it's going to do. So now I'm doing this cut stops this first cut from splitting out down the handle. So I'll go back and forth and do that probably one more time. And what I'm looking for is to have the appropriate angle here and also to have enough distance here to here to fit the bowl that I want to do. So if I'm making a larger spoon, this needs to be longer here. So I'll back up where I do this uh, stop angled cut here. But in this case, for an eater, that's just about right. This allows you to double check on the back that you have enough material here and over on this side as well to fit the spoon in its profile. It's quite lovely. And then good. Remember that axing is actually more about popping the wood out in a controlled fashion, popping it, splitting it apart. Um, it's less about it's less about carving the wood with the axe and more about creating a stress line that pops the wood out in exactly the way that you want. Okay, so now that I've got the profile I want, bowl's going to go up here, handle's up here. Let's see. 
There's some beautiful little pin marks here. I'm going to see if I can fit those into the bowl. Capture those as well. This is the nice thing about doing the crank also is that you can kind of see these opportunities and grab them. So Neil wanted a uh, spoon bowl shape that I haven't done in a while, which is uh, interesting. All right. So I can't actually grab the top one of these because to do the right size bowl shape, you want you don't want it pushed so high up that the neck starts before you get to the deepest part. You want the neck to be down in that deepest part. So, um, all right, where was I? Bowl shape. So Neil asked for a bowl shape that I haven't done in a while, which is uh, an asymmetrical bowl where you have a, a, a tooth to one side. Now, to what extent the tooth is prominent or not, I'll figure that out. But usually I like there to be sort of a, a flat tip and then it and then it comes to a fairly subtle tooth. But I like that tooth to be an actual angle. Um, I don't know. Amorphous bowls where it's it's not doesn't come to a point, they're just a little blobby for me. So I want to make sure that it can maintain an appropriate angle. Classic bowl size, think large chicken egg, draw my center line, voila, handle, uh, about two bowl lengths, and then go this way, I'll give myself a little extra length on that handle, okay, now using the axe as a pivot stop. Morning, B. Um, so uh, I'm making myself use this aggressive silky saw because I want to really get comfortable with it and understand how to use it without it chattering. So the main thing is to just be really light with it. And also because it's aggressive, it wants to start on a, a flat plane rather than start on a corner the way that a less aggressive saw would. <clears throat> Staying away from the bark side. Yeah, that's just coincidence. That's just because I wanted to capture this certain bit. Um, this is such clean cherry that I could I could shift it one way or the other within the, the blank here. But there's this little pin knot that I, I, I'm kind of enamored with and I want to have it remain. So. Okay. Okay, same on the back as it is on the front. Let me trim the end. Now that it's nice out, I'm working outside. And that means that it's almost time to muck out the greenhouse. And I'm gonna put all the wood chips in our garden cart. Not the chips, but all the wood chunks in our garden cart and they'll dry out and then we can use them in the fire pit. Okay, so I'll see how this splits here. Don't get too close to that stop cut at first, since we are on live TV. Uh, okay, that worked well. So we'll get right up to that line that I want. Notice how I'm just holding the axe in place. And then all of the work comes from the club. And you have to be gentle with the club because if you power through it at the bottom, you'll end up putting a crack in the shoulder of your bowl. Hi, Steve. Um, that, uh, this, that Oesco saw was the, uh, the silky aggressive toothed one. Uh, pretty nice, but they also sell the, uh, the silky gomboy, I believe it's called. And uh, I'm gonna try getting one of those also just to get a sense of how Silky performs when it's not a deliberately aggressive saw. So we'll see when I get around to doing that.
but it'll happen sooner or later. Okay. All right, so now to get these last bits of neck in here, let's lower this down so you guys can really see. I'm gonna start an inch up and uh, I've got a stop cut into there, going at 90 degrees to the face, and the whole thing is tilted. And you can see that by putting an angle down like this, what I do is create a stress line through the bits at the neck. And that way, I can just, the wood just pops off, and my axe blade is never actually pointed down at the shoulder, so it can't actually do anything. Hi, Sean. Um, it can't actually hurt that shoulder. So. That's the key. Now, you want to make sure that your the whole spoon is tilted because if it's straight up and down, the axe blade is always going to want to pivot to be up and down like this. So, um, you want to make sure your spoon is tilted at least a little bit. Okay. Other side. Now, if it's not popping, you want to be careful. You do want to be aware of where your deliberate line is and not let the axe go over that point. Um, this isn't foolproof. You do have to be aware of that kind of thing. Um, but it does dramatically cut down on the number of times that I damage a, a shoulder on a spoon by keeping that angle. There it is. Okay, good. Trim the bowl width. There we go. So now we're just gonna come in here and knock off this back corner. But I'm gonna stay back from this rim about uh, at least a quarter inch, maybe a little bit more. So just like that. And then I'm gonna axe around the corner and I'm gonna get a little narrower on that rim towards the, the tip there because as soon as I and come and axe right around the rim itself. I'm diving that surface down into deeper, wider section of wood, and the rim opens right up back to that original width. So, knock off the corner, round to the tip, get real close, and then round the side rim. And that bit that was real close, again, widens back up. And now, we do the middle. And the trick with uh, these ones where you're trying to get a curve is the axe is just waggling in your hand. Nice and easy, nice and slow. And it's doing the same thing every time. And my job with this hand is to place the spoon under the axe in the right spot and then to rotate my hand down. And that way the axe will hit different places with each hit. It'll, it'll hit where, uh, not different all at once, but it'll hit the same spot. But it'll be at a slightly different angle. And so that creates whatever sort of curve you want. Compound curve, even curve. Now that I have that center one, I'll go back and I'll trim up the sides to match it. Oh, and I also wanna make sure if I've got a, a twist to the rim, like this side is taller, that I leave a little more width here so that I have room to bring that rim down and thus remove the twist. Okay, that's the front of the bowl. Now, remove the corner from the back of the bowl. Again, I can get really close there because as soon as I go around the side of the rim, it opens back up again. So, same deal. These are very gentle cuts. Very gentle cuts. And then go around. Notice that I didn't get right up to the neck. That's because... What's back? What's back? Um, it's because I can support the neck on the side of the stump and just come in like this. And same deal on this side. Support. Voila. Just like that. Oh, those bits are a little hard on my back. So now, come in here at the end. Was the, was the sound off for a second there? 
Um, okay. Now I'm just axing down the end of the handle. Um, yeah, this one's probably going to have a bit of a tail flip, so I'm going to leave my handle a little bit of weight. Just like that. Got a spoon blank. Nicely symmetrical. Huh, that's good to know. Um, okay, great. Let's uh, take you for a little walk inside. Okay. Wow, this is really interactive. <laughs> All right. So, oh. Hi, Willa. Hi, sweetie. Oh. Okay. Willa, it's not time to be on my lap. I know you really want to. That, my dear, is not what's happening. Let's go like that. Nope. Off. 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 Let's go like that. Good girl. Okay. Um. Let me see here. I'm just gonna lower these legs. Tour. There's the old knife box, just like that. It's nice because everything fits inside it. So there's all the sharpening and burnishing tools. And here's the knives and the wax, everything I need. All right. <laughs> Good girl, Will. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So as we, excuse me, all of my work, I'm going to start by carving around the bowl. And I use thumb pushes for this part. Thumb push, again, is kind of a misnomer in my, in my view. Sometimes you're using your thumb, but more often than not, you're you're doing these motions where you're basically closing your fingers and holding your thumb stiff. And by holding your thumb stiff and closing your fingers, you're sort of moving the, the wood across the knife rather than moving the knife across the wood. Um, sometimes it's a bit of both. But uh, don't think of it as really a thumb push. Think of it as um, this hand has no tension, the one that's holding the knife. Um, it's just holding it in place. And then... All of the motion comes from basically closing my fingers like that. Um, hey, Dustin. Uh, so, uh, and sometimes you then rotate the knife to get a longer cut, but um, but quite often it's just about squeezing this hand and keeping this thumb stiff, and that slides the and gauges the, the you use this hand to. In, change the angle, but then all of the power is coming from that last little bit of crunching this hand shut. Um, it makes it tremendously safe because if the knife pops free in a way you didn't expect, well, there's n the, the hand that's holding the knife, there's no forward momentum with it. So um, it just makes it a lot safer to do it that way. So uh, I always do the tip of the bowl first. That's done. Now I do the back of the bowl. Again, it's just a thumb push. Now before I get too close to the neck, I usually just do part way up the shoulders. And before I get too close to the neck, I'll stop and I'll do the handle. Um, 
so that I don't bite into the area that I just made nice. Um, okay, now if I oriented everything nicely with the grain, I should be able to do a, a chest pull for this one. This is the other main type of cut that I do, where this elbow, let's move it this way so you guys can see a little bit better. This elbow is tucked into your side. That's what keeps the whole thing safe. Hi, Daniel. Um, and the closer I get to my body, the more I tuck this in so that when I'm, if I'm working right here, I basically get the heel of my palm pressed into my body and that limits the knife range um, and keeps me safe. Now, this last little bit here, it's probably easier to turn it around and do thumb push cuts to do that bit. Um, so there's nothing sacred about doing a chest pull. You do whatever cut does the job better. Um, and I find that I do maybe 60% thumb pushes and 40% chest pulls with maybe a Let's add another 3% on for um, all those other weird cuts that, that happen. So if I've oriented it correctly, I can just do a chest pull down the handle here. Now, I prefer simple shapes. Uh, just an aesthetic thing with me, but um, it does mean it has the benefit that when I flip it over and I'm doing the back, it's easier for me to kind of eyeball the shape that I'm going for. Whereas if I did a more complicated shape, like some of those amazing ones that Ty Thornick does, I, I imagine you'd either have to go back and forth more often or you'd have to um, come in on this other side. But I found that I have much less power and much less control on this side. So what you gain in being able to see it, you lose in all of those other factors. So, um, But admittedly, I have not spent really any time trying to gain that ability. So. I'm not a good uh, expert on what the limits of being able to do that are. And clearly some people are able to get very complicated spoon shapes um, nicely symmetrical on both sides. So uh, you can ask those people how they do it because I don't know. All right, so now I come down this way. Uh, right here and here is the hardest part for people to clean up. And the trick is that you gotta come down the neck and you're not gonna be able to exit off across the shoulder because then you're trying to cut across end grain as you exit and the knife just won't do it. So instead you gotta come in the shoulder and then exit going up with the grain. And you use just the tip of your knife and the thumb push and our little twisty cuts. Yeah. And, and at this stage, I don't bother getting it cleaner than that, that's fine. Um, so now, twisty cuts up on that side. Mm, something cool happening in the grain over here. Check that out. Um, Dustin, do you keep the sides absolutely square at this point? You tend to slightly angle the sides narrow at the bottom of the handle. Uh, yeah, I probably do a little, a little of both. It really depends on the spoon. And if the saw went narrower in the back, then you're naturally going to do that. Um, just to eliminate that saw line. Um, if, if I, as in this one, I did a, a better job of keeping the saw away from being narrow in the back, then I might keep it more square at this point just to leave my options open. Sometimes it's fun to do a spoon that's narrower in the front and then makes up for it by being a little wider in the back. Um, so you can play with that. You know, you can get a very delicate looking spoon from, from this angle that still is tremendously strong if you keep it a little bit wider in the back. And that's also true of cooking spoons also. Cooking spoons, um, cooking spoons, you can do that same trick, narrower in the front, wider in the back, and that makes for a much more delicate looking cooking spoon while simultaneously making it more comfortable to choke up on the cooking spoon uh, for when you're doing close in work with the cooking spoon and it keeps it strong, so. All right, now I'm gonna just do a quick little trim of the back. Over the years, I've gravitated towards just a sort of semi-circular thing in the back here, and that's, I, I like the way it looks. I like how it introduces a curve into this otherwise angular part of the spoon, and, um, and it's very simple. Um, okay, so now I have this, and again, it, I'm not looking for the final shape. I'm just trying to rough the dimensions down to the point where I can um, redraw the shape with a pencil and then get those lines nice. So now I need to remove whatever twist I have. And this one doesn't really have any twists, so kind of an awkward, um, yeah, 
Okay, great. Uh, kind of an awkward uh, cut here is to hold the spoon like this, jam it into the bit here, and then use this thumb as a pivot point for the knife. And with that, careful not to cut yourself, you can get sort of from, I don't know, if you're looking at it this way, you can usually get from like 11 o'clock down to eight o'clock. Um, that's a really useful, useful bit of the rim to get. Now from there, it's often easier to just switch to a chest pull. You can do a, a chest pull all the way along. I just, I find it faster and easier to do that little funny pivot cut here. Um, and then on this side, I do a, a different pivot cut where everything is tight up in my hands here. And um, basically this pointer finger is pressing it into my chest. This thumb is tucked back behind. You don't want it sticking up like this because you're going to be sweeping the knife around. So the thumb is tucked behind, pointer finger is there. These three fingers are holding these knuckles here. And then that allows this hand to pivot on these three fingers. And you kind of squeeze in to get everything tightly compressed so that you have some control over that pivot. And then you can pivot right up to the neck, just like that. So it's that kind of pivot. Um, so again, you want to check the top and bottom, make sure they're symmetrical. Now I can uh, grab the top of the handle. Notice how I didn't try to start the top of the handle right up at the top, but instead shaved off a little bit at the tip there. And that allows me to get the knife in without being right close to my fingers. Okay. Now if I want a tail flip, so notice how that, uh, when I changed the angle, it kind of changed where it wanted to sit on my, on my chest. And part of it is that sort of hitting different parts of the thing. So that can be quite dangerous. If you are concentrating on your knife, you change the angle too much and all of a sudden the whole thing shifts up on you. You got to be aware of that or down on you. Um, you got to be wary of that. Um, so um, just, just be aware. So if I want to tail flip, now is the time to generate that movement in the handle. And I do that here by just taking a succession of cuts until I have whatever sort of tail flip I hope to have. There, very nice. And then ease it down to be whatever I want it to be. Now, to some extent, how much of a bump I have here really has to do with uh, what the grain is doing and, and how much I need to switch back and forth. So here the grain started to tear out on this side. So um, probably, well, let's see, if I dive down further from here, I'll probably get low enough that I can go at it all the way down the neck. That's the nicest, but sometimes, depending on the wiggliness of the grain, you can't. So, I reach that down. Again, just thumb pushes going down the neck and into the back of the bowl. Um, and then in order to get this little cleaned up, I have to go the other direction. Usually I don't, but in this case, you always have to pay attention to what the wood is doing and work with it. So now I've got my side profile there. I've been moving more and more towards almost completely flat rims. So I want there to be just the tiniest little swoop to the rim so that it exits the mouth without pulling up on your lips on either side. But other than that, there's really, I want it to be basically flat. I saw a great post this morning from Tom Scandian where he, he demonstrated a test he does with his spoons where he fills them with water and what he wants to see is, is water going, you know, filling the spoon all the way from the tip to the back here. Um, yeah, so the reason for doing a flatter rim is I've found that it just, uh, you can get the spoon to hold more while still feeling shallow enough in your mouth. Um, 
and uh, and I, I just I just like it. I just prefer it. Um, I think it's possible to sort of overdo the curve in the rim. You really need just a very small amount to um, to achieve that glide out of your mouth that you need. Um, okay, so now I've got the top, and you can see. Uh, so I I think of crank more now as being the difference between the the handle, if you were to lay a ruler flat across it, and the tail flip exaggerates that somewhat, um, and and the rim, and uh, and I want that shift to happen right here, and that way by the time you hit the grain change right here, you're also going down the slope this way in towards the neck, and so you get out of it. Yeah, if you look at any. Uh, metal spoon the rims are flat it's like that. right exactly so um, this is all in my quest of trying to make wooden eating spoons feel as normal as possible um, to people because I want people to use them without thinking twice about it so, okay so now in the back I'm just gonna use um, thumb pushes and, and pivots this is where the the thumb push combined with the pivot at the end where the, with the longer knife, the 106 or something long like that, really comes into its own. Oh good, I caught a little bit of that knot in the back there. I'm happy about that. So, and now that my, up, my top rim is established, I can come up fairly close to it with the bottom rim and that will allow me to get a nice even curved cut when I draw the final shape. Okay. okay, you can see I'm pulling that rim up to about that wide. And now I'm gonna establish the back of the bowl to the handle so I want there to be a nice shallow curve, so I have to ease into the cut, gradually go deeper, and then uh, and then ease out of it at the end. If I just dive in deep, then I'll create a line where um, you have a you know one everything sort of flowing in a flat way down this way and this way, and then you have a, a ridge, a distinct ridge. So if you don't want the distinct ridge, if you want it to be a curve, hey, thanks, John. Um, if you don't want there to be a distinct ridge, you got to ease into that cut on the back, gradually make it deeper, and then do whatever you want with it once you're in that cut. So, okay, now the, the grain is a little squirrely on the back here. I'm getting some tear out, so probably that means that I will keep the form relatively simple so that I'm not fighting needlessly to uh, to get a nice smooth surface which would be much trickier if I did a, a more complicated swoop so probably I'll just taper it all the way back and it'll actually feel really nice as it comes up to that thumb push have it have some real weight to it now this handle's wider than I often go, and I'll do some thinking about that in just a second. Um, but the last thing I need to do before I redraw the shape is to bring the bowl up to narrow the rim on the back of the shoulders here. Now because the back of the shoulders, the cuts you make on one side is a different cut than the one you make on the other side, just because you're approaching it differently, uh, it will pull the spine of the neck more in one direction than the other because it will be easier to, to uh, for you to cut deeply on one side than the other. Um, so just pay attention to which way it's pulling and try to account for that. And now is also the time to just make sure you don't get bogged down and make anything narrower than it really ought to be. Now I have this beautiful knot in the neck here, but it does go all the way through, so I'll be making sure that I leave this fairly robust here at the neck. Um, but now, here we are. So 
So we're at that point. This is roughed in. I'm going to take the pencil and draw the finished line. Now, one thing that is nice about asymmetrical spoons is that uh, when you deliberately make something asymmetrical, it sort of calms the part of your brain that is sort of frantically searching for symmetry. And you end up uh, just looking at the lines instead, thinking, does that look good? And that's a really nice, um, relaxing thing compared to at least how my brain works when I'm hunting for symmetry. Um, so it's all about just looking for the lines that look good. Now, because wood carving is a subtractive craft, uh, the way to, when you're drawing your, your newly sweetened up lines, you want to figure out which side has less wood and draw that side first. It's, it's counterintuitive because you would think, oh, I need to figure out what I need to do with the side that's too big because that's going to come in more. But um, by drawing the side that has less first, you then have something to match on the other side. So on this spoon, you can see how this shoulder is a little bit wider than this shoulder. So I need to make sure I draw this first, but this is up higher than right here. So I need to make sure when I bring this in that I'm taking into account the fact that there's not as much over here. Um, so, uh, so it's a combination. There won't always be one side that's has less material in, in every way, but you need to sort of pay attention to what has what as you're drawing your line and try to either draw the one that's smaller first or take into account the size of the other side as you're doing it. So here we are, I maintain the tooth, trying to get the curves Looking good. And then I'm also trying to make sure that the, I figure out where the center of balance is and I match that with the handle. So in this case, the handle is off a little bit, which is partly why I leave my handles wide at the beginning so that I have room to drastically reduce the handle and thereby achieve, um, uh, get the handle lined up with the, with the bowl. So, you know, that's better. I'll redraw this curve here. Good, good, good. Good. Okay, so that's the finished shape that I'm going to carve to. Yep, so there's a tooth right there. That's what makes it asymmetrical. Um, okay, I often switch to a finishing knife um, because this knife does so much hogging out work that uh, a lot of times I get a cleaner finish with a fresher knife. That being said, uh, I did not, I can't remember if I sharpened this knife after someone used it at this last weekend's workshop. So we'll see, I might have to rummage around in the knives a little bit and figure out which one is best. Um, the other thing I like about these knives is they have a slightly narrower tip. So when I lowered the grind on that one I was using before, it, it the geometry of it is such that it made the tip just a fraction wider. And that makes a difference when you are trying to get a real clean cut out of the neck there. Um, so Now remember, with the thumb push, you got to start at the widest point and then from that, from the widest point on the sides, all the cuts flow towards the tip or in towards the neck. Um, for other cuts, you have to, for cuts in this orientation, you have to think in terms of where the deepest point is and all the cuts flow into that deepest point on the top and away from the deepest point on the bottom. But it's important to keep this side rim cut at 90 degrees to the uh, to that top face so that it gives you a little bit of wiggle room to adjust the curvature this way without changing the overall shape that you're that you're created. So even though it will be tempting to round off that corner, don't do it. Keep it a 90 degree face. So, now I come part way up the shoulder as before. 
and I'm going to wait, get the neck first. But you can see how much uh, cleaner of a cut I can get when the rim is narrow. It's a nice sweet curve now. Okay, so now rather than just put my knife up here and start carving down, I'm actually going to come in from this side and I'm going to cut up to it. And that's much more controlled because I can get right up to the line, right up to the corner that I want to preserve like that. And now I can start carving my way in because if you look at the grain on the back here, I want to go to about there. So the grain is running basically right with it. So um, I don't quite know what the knife is going to do and I don't want to risk it splitting off more than I intended because that could lead to me having less handle than I really wanted. Okay, despite the grain going that way, it is carving nicely. So this is just a lot of back and forth, making sure I'm getting close to that line and also that the line I'm carving is straight up and down. Um, same deal, by keeping that line straight up and down, I can then adjust the profile curvature within it without changing that plan view. Um, okay, good. Round the rim. And exit. Now, this one, because of the way the grain is, this one does not want to exit going up the handle. It just doesn't. Um, which means that my best bet is to exit going down the handle. So I'll clean it up as best I can going up. And then try and you can either push this cut down right to the bottom so that you exit right here as opposed to exiting up here. Or you can exit and get up as high as you can. And if you can get high enough, then sometimes you can come down and clean up your cut before you even reach the neck. You can sort of clean it up over here. So in this case, I'm going to try pushing it down all the way. Good, good. So it's important, if, if it's not doing what you think it's doing, the trick is to uh, back off and reapproach that area where you're having the chatter marks from a little deeper down in the wood. You can't start at that chatter mark. You gotta start further back and try and eliminate the chatter mark by essentially carving under it. There we go. Um, and because here at the neck, you don't really have many chances to do that. You have to be real calm and cool about it and not fritter away your chances of getting it nicely cleaned up. Going right in there. And I'm not worried about this because once I take the bevel, it'll, uh, once I do the bevel, it'll, it'll come in on its own. So now I'm just trimming up this side. Very good. Sometimes you end up with a spoon that just looks too clunky. And uh, the trick is to pull in the neck a little bit. But you want always want to start with the neck being a little on the thick end, just so you have options. And then pull it in a little bit at a time. Um, so that you don't end up taking off more than you intended or more than you can without it compromising the strength of the spoon. 
Okay. Now I'm going to roll up this shoulder. And I find having a pencil line so helpful to go to. Now, obviously, if you change things on the fly without drawing a new pencil line in, that can work out just fine. But I feel like uh, the pencil line has, over the years, really kept me from ruining a bunch of spoons by sort of creeping it this way and creeping it that way. Um, okay, that's the outline. Does it help to try and come at it at a 45 degree angle to the line of the handle? Explain the angle between the coming from either end. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it probably would, depending on the way the grain was, Ben. Um, yeah, it probably would. Um, but you, so that's a nice trick to have in your in your quiver. Um, but it might not work under certain circumstances. So you, you just want to sort of try it. If it's working, great. If it's not working, you know, sort of bow out of that before you dig yourself into a hole that way. All right. So now do this curvature. I used to have a very hard time getting a nice even curve on either side of these curves. They'd always end up lumpy on one side or the other. And um, I wish I could say I had a, a trick for getting it just right, but the truth is you just uh, you draw a pencil line and then you just practice and practice and practice and eventually you see some improvement in your ability to really carve to that nice curve. Okay. Okay. Now you want to make sure that your lines on the back match the lines on the front, or or at least are symmetrical, or at least are asymmetrical in a way that you're happy with. Um, you can do asymmetrical handles as well, um, and that's another great way to relax the part of your brain that's sort of frantically searching for symmetry. Um, okay. Now I'm doing the top of the handle. So I can tell that this knife is a better finishing knife right now because it's just, it's taking that surface that I created before and it's creating a, a remarkably smoother surface. Um, so again, on this spoon, I had to come at it from both directions. Good. From there, down and in. And then recarve that upper rim of the bowl. Okay, it's again it's that pivot cut on this side. And you can see how subtle that curve is to the rim. I might exaggerate that just a, a shade more, but um, it does not need to be much. And then let's just check the rim. Yep. And looks good. And then it's this cut again, where you use this as a pivot stop, your thumb. And that allows you to, the nice thing about this cut is that you're sighting down it, so you can really see the curve that you're making. Whereas, um, while this is maybe easier for beginners, it's, it's harder to see the curve that you're making. It happens more from feel which can be fine, which can be totally fine. Okay, checking from the back, checking from the front. Good, good. Uh, now I'm gonna carve the back of the bowl. And um, at this point, what I use to check the back of the bowl is just experience will tell me sort of what, um, what a shape feels like. But if you're still carving primarily for yourself and, and you aren't putting this in your mouth as you're carving it, um, you're, you're missing out on a lot of information that you could have before you're done carving about what feels good, what doesn't feel good. Um, and at this point, like I said, I basically have it a real clear sense of what certain dimensions feel like. Um, and I, I shoot for a spoon that's in between, um, usually. Uh, if, it's, if it's a regular eating spoon, I'm looking for something that feels like just sort of a regular tablespoon that 
fits all sizes of mounts. My camping spoon will have a, a bowl that's a shade bigger than that so that it is both a little more robust and works a little bit better as a cooking spoon. While my teaspoon has a size that's a shade smaller than that. And, um, and at this point I know sort of how shallow to make the bowl also. But that's something you have to gain just from trying a bunch of stuff. And really the best feedback you can get is to be keep on putting it in your mouth as you're carving it so that you know what something feels like. Because if you send off a spoon to somebody and you haven't tried putting it in your mouth or you don't have enough experience to know what, what it's going to feel like, you just don't know what their experience is going to be, right? The spoon is very... Uh, there's no hiding from a spoon that doesn't feel good. Okay. Hi, Jan. Okay, so now I'm carving down the back. And remember, the grain was a little squirrely in the back, so I'm doing very careful thumb pushes here to have a fair amount of pressure behind them. Not that I'm digging deep, but the pressure allows me to have control. So that uh, it really helps with squirrely grain to sort of have... Um, right, so like how deep it is has to do with the twist of this hand. How tightly I squeeze everything together really uh, has the effect of reducing tear out. So, um, good, just to lower this side a smidge. Sometimes if you have tear out, I'm not going to do it on this spoon because of its design, but sometimes if you have tear out and you're having trouble resolving it, um, doing uh, shifting a spoon from having a, a top face on the handle to having a center spine so that the, you're then sort of getting at the grain from a 45 degree angle instead of flat can help you resolve grain tear out. So again, having some different ideas in your in the back of your head for how you can handle certain situations to get them to resolve easily is important. Okay, good. So I've got the front of the bowl and I've pulled the rim up to be about as tight as I want it. On my finished spoon, which is to say fairly narrow. Um, and Remember how I oriented the bowl of the spoon on the squirreliest bit of grain. So now, as I am going along, I'm being very careful to feel for any time when the spoon starts to, the knife starts to tear the grain of the wood and split the grain of the wood rather than cut it. And I'll, I'll shift my angle of approach, come at it from the other direction, or sometimes when we, I only have to shift 45 degrees. Um, there we go. And recently I've been really into um, bowls that didn't have big facets back here on the shoulders, but just kind of just kind of wrapped around. And again, I think that's this sort of hunt for a normal feeling spoon where the facets are so underplayed that they just sort of you don't think about them. They function well. But they are um, they they don't draw attention to themselves, and uh, and again, I think that's my fascination with trying to make an eater that feels so normal that somebody who's never eaten with a wooden spoon doesn't think twice about picking it up and and eating with it, and and wouldn't even think to comment on it. That to me is the holy grail. Okay, so again. You can see how I wrapped this around. There's no real facets here. It's just curving around. And I'm trying to match that on the other side. But because it's, I'm coming into that cut from a different angle, I have to just pay real attention to how that's working out so that it comes out looking the same. It's on the other side. And again, I blend these facets in so that there's nothing to see. It's just one curved face. It's okay for there to be little facets, but 
In this instance, I want to avoid having a sort of facet that's obvious and something you would remark on. All right, now I run on this bevel down the back of the handle here. And because the grain is squirrely, I'm going to do it largely with thumb pushes. A lot of times I do this cut by bracing here and pulling the knife out like this, but with the grain being this touchy, thumb pushes where I can squeeze tight and thus reduce the amount of tear out, provide me with more control. All right, that's done. Bring that neckline in a little bit more. Good. And then All right, so I've got a little bit of tear out here. Um, now this is a great candidate for um, allowing there to be some imperfection, not in terms of tear out, because I don't believe in leaving tear out in spoons if I can help it, but in terms of I just widen this bevel just a smidge around this knot. It's something that when you're looking at it from the side, it hasn't changed the side profile. When you're looking at it from the top, it blends in. You can't really see it. You probably wouldn't even notice it if I hadn't brought it up. But I notice it because I'm trying to achieve a perfect thing. But rather than let it totally derail my plans, I just let there be a little wider bit of the bevel there. I'm gonna keep going real careful to feel if it's gonna tear instead of cut. I switch to a thumb push. I don't have any questions about this as, as, as I'm going along here. Okay, good. If the grain was better behaved, this might be an excellent candidate to doing multiple facets along the back, but because the grain is a little tricky, I'm gonna keep it really simple. Um, which often works best anyways, because then the grain can speak for itself. So now I'm going to run, in this case I'm going to go with pretty small facets down the handle. We'll see if I can keep them small. If I run into trouble or tear out, they might need to widen. But if I start off with small, then I can always go wider. Whereas if I start off with wide, then I, I you know, if I run into trouble, then I have no recourse but to go even wider. And that might unbalance the feel of the spoon. So. Starting off with small bevels, if you're unsure about how much tear out you're going to encounter, is a smart move. Again, keeping your options open. It's all about maintaining options as you go through this. And then leaving them attached, I'm gonna come up the rim and then slowly change the angle of the knife as I come up the rim to match the angle of the bevel on the handle. So I have to back off far enough that I don't make a bump in the rim. I can sort of ghost into that cut. And then right here at the neck is the trickiest part when you orient spoons the way I do. That cut right there is where the grain changes and you have to just kind of, your knife has to be sharp enough to deal with the fact that the grain is changing. And you might need to go back and forth a little bit to resolve it as I'm having to do right here. But, voila. Okay. Let's make that bump just a smidge. And now we do bevels at the end. Again, doing tiny little bevels to keep my options open. And also, on this sort of curvature, um, a nice even bevel will make it real obvious where your curve at the on the outside of the shape is bumpy. So you can see that bottom curve is nice and the top curve has a bump here and then this end is sticking up just a little bit. Um, <laughs> thanks Dustin. You know doing this and talking it through has really helped my teaching because it sort of gives me a dry run for talking about different ideas and it gives me a sense of where people are following and where where I'm not doing a good enough job describing something and, and how I've taught things has changed over the last six months or so 